Yeah, we're back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and here we go with Global Connections on a given Thursday with Carlos Juarez, who is in the University of the Americas in Puebla, Mexico. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, Carlos. Aloha, Jay. Always a pleasure and, and happy to reconnect with you, as always. Uh, and uh, the opportunity today for us to kind of, you know, give a little attention to a different aspect of this uh, coronavirus uh, right now. Understandably, our focus is on the United States, on watching developments in Europe. Uh, we began with China and we saw, you know, some other interesting examples in South Korea, Taiwan. But what about the other world? What about the developing world, uh, Latin America, Africa? other parts of Asia, the Middle East. Uh, right now, they are not on the front burner, but uh, they are very much, you know, clearly this this uh, this virus is now, we're told, in over 180 countries. And uh, many of these are going to be sort of like the next wave, uh, places where we're going to see how they play out. And obviously, they present real challenges in terms of their capacity, the relative, maybe weaker public health systems. And yet, in a different way also, they've also got maybe some other things that can allow them to get through it in different ways. Or, you know, you often say, you know, people that have been poor or, or maybe living on the margins, they are survivors and they know how to get by. But something like this, uh, we have yet to see how it's going to play out. So uh, a chance to talk about the well, other world. An interesting phenomenon along those lines is uh, the relationship of the disparity of income in this country and the number of cases in a community where there's disparity, and particularly, uh, you know, the African-American communities. So I think mm -hmm. that sort of tells the story locally, but it's much more accentuated uh, in some of these developing countries, isn't it? Sure. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting, uh, as you know, here in Mexico, for example, uh, one of the, actually the, the, the governor of the state of Puebla, uh, where, I, where I live, is uh, he, he made some statements a few weeks ago that were very, very, uh, you know, criticized, basically saying that this virus is uh, affecting the rich people. After all, it's the rich who travel and who you know, brought it, and the poor people somehow uh, got away. And, and it's interesting, in, in, the, in the case of Africa, in a, you know, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, it is, in fact, the wealthier who have more mobility, who travel, go to Europe, et cetera, who clearly are the ones more likely to be exposed to it than, than you know, the, those maybe largely rural communities. Uh, but nevertheless, we're, we're going to see uh, some real challenges in the coming uh, weeks uh, uh, here, how it will play out. Um, moreover, uh, as we know, the global economy is obviously making a, a bit, taking a big hit right now. And in the developing world, in, in let's say poorer countries, uh, a high percentage of the population depend on uh, the informal economy, you know, getting by every day and, and sort of w when that freezes up on them, they don't have a, a safety net. They don't have unemployment insurance. And so uh, it presents a different challenge. And yet I go back to this, you know, the poor at any place, whether even in, in, in developed countries, uh, but the poor have always managed to find ways to survive, to get by. Um, but, you know, we will have to see you know, how it's going to play out. Will, will they suffer, you know, tremendous you know, the death uh, or, or will they somehow muddle through and get by? Uh, but you know, Carlos, to this, it looks, it looks yeah. to me like looks to me like the developing countries are kind of behind behind us on the curve. Mm -hmm. They're sure. behind the countries we hear about. I mean, they're behind uh, Italy and Spain, UK, yes. uh, the US, uh, China. Why is that? Why have they not been drawn into this crisis earlier? And again, there's, there's no single answer to that. I mean, even in fact, uh, reading some recent uh, materials now, uh, Italy, why did it why did it happen there? It turns out there were some connections there to uh, uh, some Chinese workers uh, that work in, in northern Italy. But also we just had reports in the last day or two that in New York, where we've had this massive epicenter for the U.S., it basically came from Europe, not from China, but in fact, it was maybe travel uh, to and from Europe uh, that connected it there. Now, the developing world, and again, uh, we throw that term out. Of course, it means you know many different things, uh, but in general, I'm speaking mostly about places like Latin America, Central and South America, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, the Middle East, uh, and other parts of, let's say, Asia, South Asia. Um, these are places that tend to be characterized by much more crowded households. Uh, you know, even in fact, even even we think of a, of a Latin America as having this image of a, I don't know, you know, rural communities. Most Latin Americans are living in large urban centers and places that are crowded, uh, and um, and so uh, it is a recipe for potential, you know, spreading. Uh, as well, um, you know, this ability that we see now in the U.S. the importance of social distancing, staying at home. Again, that can work if you have the luxury of a home, but what if you live in a massive building with you know thousands of people? 
the crowdedness, uh, it presents a real challenge. Now, again, a lot of paradoxes. I think we have to be careful. It's not going to be the same. It's not going to play out the same. There will be places where it may be worse and places where it will be managed better. <laughs> Oh, I want to add two thoughts to that, Carlos. <clears throat> One yeah. is we have learned scientifically that, well, mm -hmm. you know, um, viruses mutate. Virus and mutation, they go hand in hand. And there's not one mutation around the world. There are a number of them. Some of them are more serious. Some of them are less serious. Some of them mm -hmm. are more contagious. Some of them are less. That's one thing we've learned. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't know where it fits yet. We'll find out because uh, mm -hmm. bioinformatics and uh, you know statistical analysis and AI. We'll find out over time how this is all worked mm -hmm. on an sure. epidemiological level. The other thing that that seems clear now, although it wasn't clear a few weeks ago, is that uh, and and this work in Japan, research in Japan on this point, mm -hmm. I think it's already well known, is that the virus is not necessarily limited to contagion by sneezing, coughing, touching. It's micro droplets, micro globules, micro, mm -hmm. you know, uh, aerosol, uh, mm -hmm. spray that stays in the air for a while. Um, so mm -hmm. if you have a lot of people, as, as you have in the developing country, they're living in a world of virus. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it's, hard, it's hard to even escape that. If you're inside yeah. with a bunch of people and just one of them has the virus, the whole room is infected for sure mm -hmm. because of this yeah. aerosolizing uh, process. Yeah, yeah, and you know the other challenge again, it's it's always hard to talk about the developing world as if it is this mass glob. There, there's such a wide variation, but many characteristics of these places. You often have maybe maybe more political instability or governments that are you know governing maybe with weaker legitimacy. Uh, and that is a recipe also for tension. If the government is seen as, uh, you know, not doing proper uh, things, uh, that can be a crisis for them. But let me add this, another paradox, I, you know, and I'm reflecting a little bit on Mexico, but also what I'm seeing in other places in South America and in places like India. You know, the, the, the public health professionals, uh, the, the, you know, the health ministries and the doctors, uh, they may be a smaller, you know, percentage. But there is a lot of capacity in terms of knowledge, and uh, and, uh, and particularly, let's say, in the case of Mexico. I mean, they're, they're taking some criticism because of a relatively lax response. But I would say that there is expertise here, and there are people who, uh, in different places, uh, in Asia, for example, they had the experience, what, in the early uh, 2000s of the SARS uh, epidemic. Uh, in Mexico here, uh, 2009, uh, now 11 years ago, uh, they were the center of the swine flu, the H1N1. And, and that experience uh, is something that helped them understand the complexities. And, and so even among the population, uh, at least those who remember it and understand it, there's an awareness that you have to do certain things, you have to change behavior. Uh, so I'm just, what I'm suggesting here is that, you know, there is some knowledge, some awareness, and also just the fact that they are latecomers to this. They're watching, they're seeing it. In today's, you know, uh, you know, social media, people are well aware of the drama that's played out in Italy, of what's happening in New York today or in other places, so that it gives them sort of like a, an early warning signal of some kind. Uh, and and so that's interesting. But you know, that's true, about, Carlos. We had, no. a, we had a show with, uh, we had a show with um, one of our hosts in Singapore uh, mm -hmm. yesterday, the day before. And um, of course, uh, Singapore, you know, as, as usual, has its act together on this uh, mm -hmm. and people do follow the rules. Um, sure. But but I asked her about it, you know, I asked her to compare Singapore with the U.S. And it was clear that she watches uh, the same programs that we watch, that I watch and mm -hmm. that you watch. And the whole yeah. world is informed what Donald Trump is saying. Mm -hmm. The whole world sure, is sure. informed what's happening, you know, in the U.S., whether it's accurate, which you know I don't feel it is accurate um, or not. You know, they're getting the same message that we are. So sure, this is a, sure. indeed a flat world on communications, and every one oh, yeah. of those developing countries gets the same communications that we do. Sure, sure. And, and again, I, I go back to this, you know, the expertise, because those who are managing, you know, health ministries, and, and they, they are very knowledgeable. Most of them in, in, in let's say, in Latin America, uh, they have trained in, in Johns Hopkins University or University of Washington. Uh, many from Africa or even India have trained in the UK, so they, they have... Uh, uh, you know, connection to the, the world of knowledge and understanding. They're, they're not operating in a void. Um, but, you know, nevertheless, I mean, we, we are anticipating a, a severe shock to this part of the world, the developing world. Uh, just, uh, I think, yesterday, the Oxfam, one of the leading, uh, you know, NGOs uh, that works on issues of poverty, has issued a very, you know, dramatic report uh, indicating that 
probably as much as uh, 500 million people, you know, six to eight percent of the global population is at risk of falling below the poverty line. Uh, so we've had for some decades now uh, efforts to address poverty in the worst uh, case, and there has been significant progress. Uh, uh, but right now, there's a real risk of, uh, you know, the last 10 years may just disappear very quickly. Uh, and in parts of that, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, parts of the Middle East, we may very well see, uh, you know, several decades of progress quickly slip away. Uh, what do you also, mean by that, Carlos? What do you mean uh, decades well, of progress? What, what do you mean disappear? Well, simply by uh, the percentage of the population that has been brought out of the extreme poverty. So, you know, 30 years ago, there was a larger percentage of, of the poorest people living in, in dire conditions. Uh, there has been substantial progress in many parts of the world. So that uh, what I'm saying is that this report from Oxfam is, is, is indicating that if action is not taken or if the worst case plays out, we could see, uh, they indicate six to eight percent of the global population, about 500 million people, could suddenly be brought back down into the extreme poverty. So uh, again, just you know, setting back all the progress that's been made in the last decade or two. Uh, so you know, it, it's hard to measure these things, but, but again, uh, it's going to play out differently in different areas. Uh, you know, um, many of these different places will often have a, a tendency to have young populations, and you know that can work both ways. Uh, we know, or we've been told at least early on, that uh, those that are more vulnerable include older populations. And so, if you have a young population, maybe you're, you're you've got you know a little more uh, I don't know uh, safety there. Uh, but the other is that in so many parts of the world we have crowded populations in in, in you know big cities, urban areas. Um, we've already got, you know, tensions there just from that and add to that suddenly the need to isolate uh, the loss of job and opportunities. And you can see a, a recipe for more domestic violence, more, you know, social uh, instability uh, and chaos. Um, and then another thing we don't think about, uh, there are places in the world uh, where we have hot spots, where we have wars and violence. Uh, it, it's in Syria, in the Middle East, or Iraq, you know, uh, and maybe even a place like Venezuela uh, that today is facing a real challenge because the political dynamic is very unstable. You add to that suddenly this crisis, people already don't trust the government and, you know, what information they're getting, uh, conspiracy theories abound. And so there, it's a recipe for creating more paranoia. That's, more, very, uh, that's very sad when people take uh, advantage of a of a crisis and um, you know take see it as an opportunity but i do want to mention uh, that saudi arabia has uh, unilaterally terminated the hostilities uh, with yemen yeah. is that a is that a, 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 a you know an event that will be repeated or is that just a one off possibility well you know, I think in many many of these conflict zones that I've just mentioned, you're going to see a little bit of a holding off, slowing slowing down. Uh, but it also presents opportunities. Again, uh, I, I think uh, I was reading a, a report about ISIS that you know we've been told in the last you know months and years has been eliminated, or at least you know its control over territory in Syria and northern Iraq has been taken away. Well, they're using it as an opportunity now to somehow you know regroup and 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 not just that. You have several dynamics. Uh, those forces, uh, international forces that have been there, uh, including many from different European countries and Australians, in these last few weeks, they've all basically gone home. Uh, the U.S. has a very small footprint there, but it does have a presence. It, it was not possible to completely leave. But uh, I guess what I'm getting at there is that it's interesting. When you look at this ISIS group, I mean, they have uh, long been survivors living on their own, and they've controlled their own food supply, water supply. So they are, in some ways, outside of, let's say, the, the exposure to this, uh, and they have maybe an ability to survive a little bit longer than they might otherwise. Uh, but, you know, beyond that, it's going to be very interesting to see. Uh, I mentioned Venezuela, this uh, South American country that, of course, you know, we the last year, year and a half has been uh, obviously in a strange uh, situation. They have two leaders that claim to be presidents. Uh, in the last week, uh, there's, uh, you know, been uh, a lot of paranoia down there that the U.S. is planning an invasion, mobilizing military forces in the Caribbean. And recall this past week, uh, in one of his uh, week, week uh, I'm sorry, one of his daily press conferences, President Trump suddenly turned, uh, switched away from the pandemic to talk about anti-narcotics efforts in the Caribbean and da da da. And uh, so, uh, in some of the social media coming out of Venezuela and, and, and circulating in Latin America, there's been a lot of alarm that somehow the U.S. is going to use this opportunity to uh, uh, foster a change of government, a coup d'etat. I don't see that in the cards. I think right now the last thing the U.S. needs is to somehow 
engage in some military action, uh, I think he would be ill-advised. I don't see that happening, but it doesn't but stop. What about you the other side of it, Carlos? What about the yeah. side of it in Venezuela? I mean, uh, no. you know, Trump has Trump has done a really, really awful job in terms of leadership in a crisis. And every day you can see that repeated. And he has made it worse. I think a, a, a lot of people have died because of him. I, I hope the, the voters understand that in November or whenever they can vote. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's, there's going to be an effect in all these countries because, as I mentioned before, they all get to see him. They all get to mm -hmm. see him on television. They know what he's saying. Um, they can make their own decisions. I, I suppose it depends whether they look at Fox News or CNBC, but, you know, mm -hmm. they, they're, they're affected by it. And I guess my question to you, not only in Venezuela, but, but elsewhere in the world, how are people globally, and maybe there's no easy answer, how are they being affected by what the United States is doing, how it's making mistakes, how it's stumbling and bumbling and trying to avoid blame and all the negative things that are happening in his, in his uh, press conferences? Yeah, you know, uh, first thought would be this, uh, you know, Fox News is, of course, a, a key part of the U.S. Uh, uh, press. Uh, it, it's not as widely uh, watched outside of the U.S. People know about it, but it's not, it doesn't have the same uh, polarization, whereas in the U.S., you know, half the population, you know, is is getting their information just from that, not quite in the world. Uh, and, and, you know, and just in my own scanning, let's say in Latin America, the perspective there, there, there is an awareness that there's tensions in the U.S. and that the president is facing credibility crises that he's using, you know, uh, well, not he's using, but that he's he's clearly, uh, let's say he's he, there, he's being called upon uh, for some of his, uh, you know, misinformation and, and, and bumbling along the way. Uh, but it's interesting. I think you're going to see that play out in a lot of different places as well. Uh, here in Mexico, for example, the president has taken a lot of criticism for being slow in responding and not taking it seriously. Similarly, in Brazil, the leader there, Bolsonaro, has also been heavily criticized by uh, his his you know slow response. Uh, so I think individually, different countries are going to see that. Now, by contrast, you can see you know uh, press conferences that say in Europe or or in, in other places or or not pre just press conference, but the way in which the leaders are handling it. Uh, not quite as as uh, criticized in the same way as we see here. So I think there's just an unevenness there. Uh, but this presents a challenge for all political leaders, how well they manage the communication during this crisis, uh, building confidence. For some, it can be an opportunity to, to build that trust and gain it. Uh, look at today, we can say the governors in some cases, particularly, you know, Andrew Cuomo has, has gained the uh, rock star status as, you know, this is how you're supposed to do it. You know, tell the facts, uh, show empathy. Um, and uh, I think other leaders are also having to confront this same thing. Uh, but uh, again, uh, with where, wide variation, uh, you've got some countries, let's say uh, South Africa in, in the southern uh, part of the continent there is always considered more of a leader in, in, in the region, uh, providing some leadership, providing a, you know, a, a, a more, uh, I don't know, more respect for, for its, its, its handling of the crisis. Uh, but a number of other places where you have authoritarian leaders that don't have let's say, uh, legitimacy in the same way, uh, that presents just more opportunity for people to get uh, skeptical and, and harder to mobilize support. I mean, because if you need people to cooperate and to, you know, you talk about Singapore, uh, and in fact, what's clear now is South, uh, the places that have done it so successfully, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, even Japan, um, they are places that are interestingly democracies in their own right. I mean, they've got variations of authoritarian rule, but they are good information, strong preparation. They responded early, uh, but more importantly, they, they you know they've got maybe more open open societies. Uh, in a lot of places where that doesn't exist, maybe Philippines. I don't know, maybe some other authority. You know, you mentioned Saudi Arabia earlier, and and I don't know if you saw this report, but a very high number of the Saudi royal family has now apparently been infected with this uh, virus, and uh, and and so that's creating its own internal dynamics there. What, what is that going to mean? What if the crown prince or what if the, you know, the, the, uh, the king himself should die? Uh, I think in a lot of places we're going to see uh, this crisis is going to become a political uh, hot potato. Uh, in, in, in another report I was just reading about Pakistan, which is a very large population, uh, you've got doctors protesting there because they don't have uh, sufficient equipment and support. And in fact, the police uh, beating them up, beating up the doctors because they were out trying to protest. Well, you know, Pakistan is not an open, you know, democratic society, mm. uh, and yet, and and of course, it does have 
you know, a, a large population, but it also has an elite that is well educated and 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 and, and doctors who are certainly uh, they may have less capacity, but but uh, they're they're not uh, on the margin. But uh, there's been a lot of tensions happening in in places all around the world. Uh, well, and it's a it's a grim picture. Yeah. We don't have the medical yeah. infrastructure, the healthcare infrastructure. We have the, these cultures that bring people together in tight spots, sure. and we're yeah. finding out that's that's a, a recipe for contagion. Um, we yeah. have the possibility of uh, violence, domestic violence, all the way up to social unrest, all the way up to yeah. revolution. Uh, yeah. We have the possibility and that dictators will clamp down on people. We have governmental possibility of change. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we have a tremendous unfairness, disparity, what have you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really yeah. kind of yeah. looking, looking down a, a really grim tunnel. And so my yeah. question yeah. to you is, you know, in 1918, late 1918, Spanish flu uh, went with our boys to Europe. It came. Mm -hmm. It was. It was. It was. It, it, patient zero was in Kansas here. Yeah, it went with yeah. our boys to Europe. It festered in Europe. A lot of cases in Europe. And when our boys came back after the war, nineteen nineteen or so, so did so did the Spanish flu, and we mm -hmm. had a terrific uh, re-infection, -inf re re-recontagion mm -hmm. in the yeah, U.S. Yeah. Worse than the first one. And so, um, you know, that's the big risk, a, a lack of coordination by whatever it is, United Nations, by, by Donald Trump, by the World Health Organization, whatever it is, there's nobody leading, coordinating the world. So the grim yeah. picture that you paint um, is likely, uh, tell me I'm wrong, is likely to result in horrendous case numbers and fatality numbers, horrendous infection in most geographical locations in the world. You know, the, um, nearly the whole world has this. And then coming right back to the U.S. So even if we beat it here, it'll be back. This yeah. is most concerning. I, I wonder what your thoughts are, because, you know, what the picture that we're both appreciating here is, is a picture that will have direct effect on this country. Yeah. And and in, in it, it, it operates in many ways because, again, there's tremendous mobility. Uh, look, I mean, right now everything is a bit on hold because of the travel. But as things get relaxed, so let's say two, three, four, five, six months from now, that will have to resume. And, and, you know, the construction industry in the U.S. will kind of kick back in and other things. You need workers. They're going to have to come uh, from somewhere. Uh, and so this is going to be with us for some time. Um, the other thing real quick that I wanted to mention is that one of the challenges in the developing world is that, at this point, we really don't know. We don't have full information because there's not a lot of testing going on. Uh, they don't have the capacity. They don't have the, you know, the, well, the, the testing uh, is, is simply not there. So we don't fully know. Uh, what we see are different little nuggets of, of anecdotes here and there. Uh, about a week ago, a very high drama played out in, in the port city in, in Ecuador, in South America, Guayaquil, the port city. Uh, it, be, it, be, it became like the epicenter of that country right now. And there was such a, a wave of deaths that uh, the government couldn't even come to pick them up. Uh, that is, you know, to take them to the morgue. People began putting dead bodies in the street. Uh, and, and now they've come because they don't even have uh, uh, caskets, uh, capacity to take them away. They've put them in cardboard boxes. Uh, and it's just a very ugly, ugly example. Uh, and again, heightening the tensions, a place that already has political uh, you know, instability and, and, and crisis and, and legitimacy crisis for some leaders, uh, this is going to play out. Uh, I, I want to underscore that we have to appreciate there's going to be wide variation. So there will be some places, even poor developing countries, that are probably going to be able to manage it better than others, may not be affected in the same way, but there will be others where it could be quite ugly. We just don't know quite fully. Um, and then I want to finish with another quick anecdote. Uh, I was reading where in, in France, uh, of course, uh, which has long, you know, historical ties with many parts of West Africa, many of its former colonies, uh, there was a, a, a TV uh, show in which several French doctors were commenting about, uh, you know, the, the virus and, and, and the need to, you know, test for vaccines. And one of the doctors made a statement that, well, Africa presents a good laboratory for us to test because they don't have uh, uh, ICUs, a lot of masks, uh, et cetera. And it was a backlash, a, a tremendous criticism that it was seen as a form of a, a, a sort of a colonial mentality that somehow you can look to the poor developing countries as the place where you go and test all your, you know, your vaccines and so on. Uh, so there's tensions that are going to be heightened there that have always been there. But this this is going to kind of be a, a, an opportunity for them to flare up again. Um, not just uh, that, but obviously when the world economy goes into a massive decline that we're seeing now, uh, whether it's in China and the U.S., 
it's going to impact every other place. Uh, uh, even Mexico today is going to suffer tremendously because its exports are to the U.S. And if the economy here slows down, well, it slows down the economy of our neighbor to the south and, and so on. So every the, the interdependence of the world economy, uh, as well in many developing countries, you still have a reality where the economies tend to depend on a small number of, of, of exports, if you will. And if those commodities, uh, whatever they might be, are suddenly uh, drastically stopped, uh, they don't have the capacity to weather that. They don't have the safety net. They don't have the resources. Uh, and so it's going to be, again, a recipe for disaster in a lot of places. Yeah. So we need, we need um, uh, leadership or at least coordination. I think uh, the United States has demonstrated under the current administration, we cannot lead, we cannot coordinate, we can't even handle our own problem. Um, and yeah. it's just getting worse here. So, um, and, and of course, uh, Donald Trump is in a big argument now with the World Health Organization. He wants the executive to resign. Um, he's pulling all his funds, as we want to say, cut off funding. I mean, this is not a matter of leadership or, or coordination, it's destructive. Yeah. So the question yeah. is, you know, if, you, if, if I made you king of the universe, Carlos, what would you do to ameliorate <laughs> these disparities and this yeah. tremendous risk of contagion, death, uh, instability, chaos, a state of nature yeah. coming soon, yeah. what would you do? Well, look, I mean, uh, this is a, a, a classic example of a global issue, a global problem that requires global solutions. In other words, uh, and yet, again, uh, the paradox, it has to be solved at the local level, but it requires coordination and cooperation. And and just as I talked to the, we said at the beginning, there is this knowledge, awareness, you know, the social media, you know, and, and maybe people in every part of the world can see what's going on. Uh, but sadly, we live at a time right now where this multilateralism, this, you know, international cooperation has been somewhat uh, suppressed and, and, and reflected both in Donald Trump, but even the European Union with its own crisis uh, has not been able to maybe take on that leadership role. Uh, interestingly, China, China is uh, in some ways filling the void as it has been in other ways uh, over these past years, uh, the relative decline of the U.S. And just as a case in point here in Mexico, I think yesterday uh, or day before yesterday, a, a large plane arrives from China bringing respirators to the rescue here, medical equipment. Uh, and, and of course, you know, the U.S. Uh, would in a more maybe in a different world where, where, where maybe a U.S. leader would be more uh, inclined to cooperate and coordinate with the U.S. I'm sorry, with Mexico, you might see more of that happening here or even with Canada. But we've got President Trump, you know, stopping supplies going to Canada, obviously. And, and again, the paradox, Mexico is one of the leading manufacturers of medical supplies and equipment. Uh, and, yeah, and, not, and, and, you know, and so you've got a country here that manufactures it, but not for its internal market. It's done for export, export to the U.S. But actually, even the, this plane load that just came from China that I mentioned, uh, there, there's a lot of criticism that a few months ago, Mexico sent a lot of supplies to China. Uh, and now it has to buy them back at a higher price, uh, things that were even assembled and made, it, made in Mexico. So you have uh, examples of, you know, capitalism taking on a different different dimension here. Uh, but it is it's a mess. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but again, I, I mentioned China. I mean, I don't see it as the savior of the world, but it's also using its own soft power. Uh, and it has deep links and connections to Africa and a, and a very large footprint there. So that it's likely to be the, 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 the one country that's going to find itself you know, coming to the rescue in some ways, not the oh, United that's States. True. Uh, Just not last hour, Carlos, we had a show mm -hmm. with a Chinese, Chinese American researcher here at the John A. Burns School of Medicine, who's working mm -hmm. on a, a drug called Ziplocone, as I recall. Um, mm -hmm. And this is a drug that has been demonstrated effective in saving lives with coronavirus. Mm -hmm. That is really something. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And um, he's working, he's in a collaboration with another Chinese doctor out of guess where, Wuhan. Uh, and the two, <laughs> yeah, of them are, yeah. two of them are doing this really for, for global purposes. Uh, they are mm -hmm. committed, mm -hmm. they are trying so hard uh, mm -hmm. as individuals, you know, who have individual missions in the case um, to, mm -hmm. to save the world. Um, yeah. And I find that very interesting. So while the administration is, is criticizing the, the Chinese, while the administration is encouraging racism against Chinese, which is happening, um, there are in fact collaborations between Americans and mm -hmm. Chinese that could sure. have a tremendous collaborative effect. So yeah. uh, misinformation is everywhere. 
but the reality is they are collaborating with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And China again, I just underscore that China is so deeply connected to so much of the world now, especially the developing world. They are the largest, prior, you know, foreign investor in Africa, in several South American countries, Bolivia and Peru, where they extract mines, uh, or you know, basically they, they they get a lot of the natural resources. Uh, and so they have an interest, they have a, a need for their own economy to keep things flowing. Uh, and, and, and they also have today maybe a growing um, presence in, in the international community in a way that 20, 30 years ago they did not. Um, and, and, you know, whether it's exporting good, uh, goods. Uh, let me, you know, actually, before I finish, I wanted to, uh, another curious thing that's come up here is uh, uh, another country uh, that has a long history of having sort of an international presence on issues of public health is the tiny island of, of Cuba. Uh, Cuba, especially in the 70s and into the 80s, had a long history of exporting doctors, uh, especially to South, South uh, I'm sorry, Africa, Angola mm -hmm. in particular, uh, but also other parts of Latin America. And the issue just played out here in Mexico because uh, uh, the Mexican president uh, made some reference to, well, he will look into the possibility that maybe we can bring some Cuban doctors here. Uh, it's a very sensitive issue because uh, the United States and, and Mexico obviously have a complex uh, you know, relationship, and yet this is one of the issues that has been a red line for the United States. You know, they will allow Mexico to be sympathetic to Cuba, to you know, have you know, natural ties they've had, but they've made very clear, do not bring any uh, doctors from Cuba here, because that, that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a quirky thing. Uh, but I would say this, you know, Cuba, which has exported, again, doctors for decades, it sounds in, on paper like, oh, they're just you know, nice, they have all this capacity. In fact, it's a money-making scheme. The Cuban government basically will send a group of doctors to you know, even places in Europe or throughout Africa. Those, those governments will pay the Cuban government a pretty handsome price, 50, 60 grand per doctor. The doctors don't get that money. They get a tiny little you know, stipend. They get sent to the country. They can't take their families. Basically, it's a form of, uh, you know, a curious form of modern slavery. Uh, and yet for Cuba, it looks good. It looks like they're, you know, their own soft power exporting these, you know, these doctors. Uh, but there's a lot more cynical perspective there because it really is the government. It's one of the major sources of export earnings that they get uh, because they don't they don't export a lot of, you know, trade and goods. They export doctors and they get paid for it. Uh, and here in Mexico, they've been trying to mobilize more medical professionals. Uh, and the president has kind of put a program out there to, you know, mm -hmm. to get, you know, re retired doctors to come to, you know, retool different doctors to, to address this crisis. Uh, they haven't had immediate success in getting enough. So uh, the, the president floated this idea of maybe bringing in some Cuban doctors, but that, that's not likely to go over too well with, with Washington. Well, one thing is clear from this discussion is that the world, not just the U.S., I mean, clearly the U.S. is in a transformation. And we come out the other side of this, this place is going to be different. Our institutions are being tested. Our leaders are being tested. Yes. Our people, right down the block, across the street, they're being tested. We are all being tested. And we're finding out things about ourselves that maybe we didn't know. Some of those things are good. Some of those things are not so good. But it's more than that. It's that the whole world is being tested, that the whole yeah. world is involved in a transformation. And when you look down the other side, hopefully at the light at the end of the tunnel here, and, and look around, like Groundhog's Day, look around, and hopefully it's gone. We have a, you know, a vaccine that will, that will, or a therapeutic medicine or a combination that will stop this thing. The world is going to be different economically and in terms of social order. The existing yeah. social order, I mean, the one that existed a month ago is over. So yeah. how do this you This is a game that? changer. Yeah, and what's your reaction to that, Carl? Do you agree? And what do you see at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, I mean, again, it is mind boggling. There's no question that this is a game changer in a way that in our lifetime we will have never seen. The world would not be the same. If you can fast forward, you know, two years from now, five years from now, uh, even something like travel that we took for granted, you can just go anywhere and all this mobility. Uh, I think from here on out, once we begin to gradually open it, it'll never quite be the same. And, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, reading some interesting things that, you know, this is a massive blow, of course, to like the restaurant industry, hospitality industry. Now, eventually people are going to want to travel and vacation, yes. But even think about restaurants. Many of them are not going to survive. We're, we're told probably most of them will not. So when we come back to something normal, to the new normal, it will never quite be the same as the old. And, and uh, I think it's, it's pretty frightening to think of that. Um, and uh, so it is going to be a game changer on so many levels. Uh, and, uh, 
And yet, again, I, I would just to be the more optimistic side there, I think what we're seeing is it's bringing out the ugliness and some of what we described here, you know, the crisis and domestic violence, et cetera. But it's also in some small ways, it's also bringing out uh, an awareness that we have to think about others. We have to be more community minded. We have to, uh, you know, reach out. Uh, and I, I think this is happening in many parts, certainly in the U.S., where suddenly people are getting to know their neighbors for the first time. Uh, and, and I saw this play out and I've got some uh, good contacts in Madrid that have been you know, surviving the, the massive lockdown there where every day they go out at eight o'clock at night and they you know, sing a song to you know, thank the, uh, all the first responders. But for the first time, people are getting to know their neighbors in a way that didn't exist you know, before this. So I don't know, I, I think we're gonna see, certainly the world will never quite be what it was before. Uh, and it's gonna be interesting to see you know, we, we've been, oh, it's all going to end in a month or two. No, no, no. This is going to be with us. It's going to take probably a year or two to transition. But once we do come back, it's not going to be the same. It's going to be a game changer on so many levels. Uh, I can't even begin to think. Every time you, you, you open up uh, and think about it, it can be scary. Hopefully, there will be some other opportunities that come out of this. Again, good gestures. And, uh, and the work environment, for example. Now, clearly, we're going to see that some people realize and some firms and, and organizations realize people can work from home. They can work remotely. Uh, that works for some. It doesn't work for everything. You can't, you know, build, you know, build a construction site, you know, over the internet. You need people to be there to assemble it. Uh, but certainly many other things are going to change how we do what we do. Uh, and even how we socialize. I think I, I heard a, a, a reference uh, to this, uh, you know, the, the infamous Dr. Fauci saying how we probably should never shake hands anymore. And that's a scary thought that we can no longer hug or shake hands. And, and you know, especially as a Latin, a Latin American, we love to hug and kiss. And the idea that, gosh, we can't do that ever again, that, that's a scary thought. Uh, I don't know. I think it's going to be a mixed bag. And uh, I guess you know, we'll have to wait and see. But it, this is a game changer in ways that we have yet to figure out. Yeah, changes human interaction, human relationships. Yes. But, you know, that's our a mission is clear, Carlos. We have to keep following it. We have to identify the issues. We have to discuss which way it's going, maybe come to some solutions. Uh, you and me, yeah. every couple of weeks, I think it's really important. Yes. And I look yeah, forward to having these discussions with you. And I yes. also want to make sure that you're staying safe. Yes. So yes. Absolutely. please stay safe, Carlos. Thank Will you do. so much. Aloha. Aloha.